Hello and thanks for joining us for this edition of Sustaining Us here on KLCS PBS. I'm David Nazar. Are we prepared for a monster earthquake here in Southern California? Say, for example, a seven or eight point Tembler, somewhere like downtown LA, Santa Monica, the San Fernando Valley, where millions of people live. A quake of this magnitude in a dense urban setting could cause catastrophic injury and death and economic damage never witnessed before. However, what if there are a way for us to possibly avoid some of the carnage? Well, the United States Geological Survey in Pasadena is working to do just that. California is famous for its great weather, majestic mountains, and amazing beaches. California is infamous for its earthquakes. The two most notorious tumblers are still the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and the 1994 Northridge earthquake because of the massive destruction and loss of life. In July of 2019, the Golden State was hit with a seven magnitude quake, the Ridgecrest earthquake. However, the epicenter was about 120 miles northeast of Los Angeles a far distance from any major urban area. So fortunately, there were no injuries or lives lost. We have earthquakes every day in Southern California, 20 to 30 earthquakes. Some of them we feel, some of them we don't. It's a matter of, of just when it's gonna happen, not a matter of if. So we want people to be as ready as possible. Robert DeGroote is a scientist with the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. DeGroote studies everything from earthquakes and earthquake behavior to risk reduction and quake preparedness. He says California is due for a catastrophic tembler. The big event that really put California on notice in recent times is the 1994 magnitude 6.7 Northridge earthquake. It was an event that happened in a very highly populated region of the San Fernando Valley. And it really put us on notice about how earthquakes can affect very densely populated regions. And the one message, takeaway message from this particular earthquake, of course, is it wasn't the big one. It was a moderately sized earthquake. So it actually, but did a considerable amount of damage in a number of different areas. There were something in the order of 57 deaths and many billions of dollars of damage. We are going to have the big earthquake at some point in the future. And so anything we can do now, anything we can do to reduce the risk due to that earthquake at this point will determine how we're able to recover from that event. So anything that we can build into our resiliency toolbox, into our sustainability toolbox, will allow us to be much more uh, effective once the earthquake is over. USGS is building something in the hopes of sustaining us when the next massive quake hits. Scientists have developed an earthquake early warning system for the United States West Coast, designed specifically to target California as well as Oregon and Washington. It's known as ShakeAlert. About half the project has been completed using decades of earthquake science and a network of sensors to monitor for the earliest sign of a quake before sending you a warning. Shake Alert can give seconds, and in some cases, tens of seconds of advanced earthquake warning, depending upon how close or how far away you live from a fault line. The Shake Alert Earthquake Early Warning System works on the principle of using seismic stations, basically seismometers in the field. And when the system is complete, we're looking at about 1,675 stations that will allow the system to be, to be fully active. And the idea is you pick up the earthquake in the field. Once that information is collected there, it's sent immediately to a series of processing centers. And from there, uh, an alert is generated and then the alert gets distributed. So we need to be able to detect it and then decide whether or not an alert needs to be issued. And then we get the, the word out to folks. So one of the really th things that distinguishes Shake Alert from other alerting systems is the fact that everything is automatic. And then once that alert is issued by the USGS, then it's distributed through a whole variety of, of pathways, one of which could potentially be the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, which is operated by FEMA. And that message would show up on your phone, much like an Amber Alert message shows up currently. Our motto is by every means available. So delivery of shake alerts 
would be potentially on your cell phone, on your car radio, on your television. It could come through reverse 911. As many ways possible because your phone might be turned off. So the idea is to get the message out. USGS says that message must be heard loudly and clearly, in part because of the dangerous San Andreas fault line threatening California. San Andreas Fault starts way north of the city of San Francisco and actually cuts just west of the city of the peninsula and goes south through San Jose to the west of San Jose, down through the part of central California along the coast, goes through the, behind the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles, and then goes through San Bernardino, ultimately through places like um, Palm Springs, and then exits around the Salton Sea. If you think of Southern California much like a shattered windshield of a car, we have many, many, many faults. And part of the reason is, is the San Andreas Fault has a kink in it, a bend, it's called the Big Bend, that has effectively shattered the crust of Southern California and produced many hundreds of faults. And they're all capable of producing earthquakes. Here's just a sample of some of those hundreds of faults. In Pasadena, where USGS is located, there is the Raymond Fault, which works its way through that city, then traveling west where the Raymond Fault morphs into the Hollywood Fault. Out here on the corner of Hollywood and Vine, the hill where the iconic Capitol Records building is located was produced from the Hollywood Fault. If you travel even farther west into West Los Angeles on Santa Monica Boulevard, the Hollywood Fault is now the Santa Monica Fault. And if you've ever driven through this part of the city, you're familiar with the well-known Los Angeles Mormon Temple, which sits directly above the Santa Monica Fault on that grassy hill. The Santa Monica Fault winds its way through the historic Veterans Administration property near the corner of Wilshire and Sepulveda in West LA. Some of these faults loop through miles of Southern California cities. Earthquakes are one of our main focuses at Cal OES. Ryan Arba was formerly with the Seismic Hazards Program at Cal OES, the California Office of Emergency Services in Sacramento. Cal OES coordinates mutual aid across the state when there's a disaster, working with local and state agencies and FEMA. Arba says Shake Alert is all about resiliency and sustainability. We have the Shake Alert technology that allows us, once an earthquake's begun, to detect the earthquake at its earliest stages and to send an alert before shaking occurs. So because earthquakes are infrequent, uh, which we're very fortunate for, but we know they're gonna happen, this will hopefully just give us that extra boost so that everybody can receive that alert, take that protective action before the shaking starts. Overarching all of that is the concept of being resilient. And it's, it's a way of empowering our uh, communities in order to take responsibility for that um, and to make sure that they're safe um, during that. So what ShakeAlert does, not only for those individuals, it also allows these large systems that our society relies on, the electric grid, um, natural gas, water, other transportation routes uh, in and out for, um, say, all of our goods. Our goods come into a port, they go to other parts of the country or they come in from other parts of the country. All of those different segments of society have an opportunity with ShakeAlert to look at their operations, potentially introduce an automated shutoff, which could then help resume the services faster. This isn't the magic solution. It's not gonna, it's not gonna save everything. That said, it will save some people's lives. It will prevent a lot of injuries and hopefully it'll prevent a lot of damage as well. And that's important enough to us and especially the sustainable future of California that California state government is investing in this. And we're working with everyone to get this online as soon as possible. What, what we're looking at in terms of destruction is thousands of lives lost in this earthquake. Destruction across Southern California is about $210 billion of losses of this magnitude 7.8 earthquake. And to give you a sense of the shaking that went on during the Northridge earthquake, you're talking maybe something in order of 10 to 15 seconds of shaking whereas this earthquake will have shaking that's going to last for two and a half minutes. And if you've ever driven around downtown recently, you've noticed all the new towers and skyscrapers around Staples Center in that area. There are in fact more tall tower projects being built here in LA County than almost any other major urban US city. The question is, are they safe? Well, joining me now to discuss is Hal Bastian. Hal is 
executive vice president of major properties and he's one of the leaders of the downtown LA Renaissance for over 25 years. Thanks for being here, Hal. It's great to be with you, David. So there is your question. Are these monster towers safe? Yes. There you go. The interview's <laughs> finished. Yeah, I, you know, in all seriousness, I've been in downtown since 1994. And we're in a, in a place with pretty big buildings um, relative to New York and Shanghai. Uh, we don't have a lot of tall buildings. But the issue is um, that we have great engineering that has been going on all over the world for, um, for earthquake uh, uh, earthquake engineering for tall buildings and so this isn't our first time to the rodeo and buildings are built with lots of thought in mind because um, people that build buildings don't want to kill people obviously every area of the country hell has their natural disasters would you rather have a hurricane a wildfire or an earthquake because those buildings listen those are tall buildings hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I have been here since 1960. I was in the 1971 Silmar, Silmar earthquake. I was in uh, the 1994 Northridge earthquake. So I've had two really big events in 60 years and I'll take that all day long. You deal with so many developers, city leaders, community leaders, real estate folks. Is there any concern? Do they talk among themselves and say, you know what, hey, maybe we just should not be building these giant monstrosities of towers here in earthquake country? Yeah. Well, the first thing is I would take exception to the word monstrosity because I happen to think that they're beautiful. They're very, very tall buildings. But relative to uh, other world areas, so for instance, Tokyo, which has a lot more seismic activity than uh, we do, they have tall buildings here and uh, there, and we have them here. And, um, you know, some of my best friends are structural engineers. And in getting ready for this interview, I talked to them a, a little bit. And the bottom line is, we don't design uh, these tall buildings to be earthquake proof and sustain no damage. Uh, they're designed to save human lives and keep any kind of structural failure from happening. And uh, your initial question is, are they safe? Well, I've been in and around downtown LA since 1994. And if I didn't feel safe, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be going into tall towers. So basically what you're saying is these towers are not earthquake proof, but they are earthquake safe. Correct. Talk a little bit about what this um, LA downtown renaissance is. As I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, I had left LA for about 10 years and I returned and now it looks like Manhattan. I mean, this is crazy what's <laughs> happening in downtown Los Angeles. Well, I'll tell you, it may seem crazy to you, but it's an overnight wonder I've been working on for 25 years. So we've been working on it for a long time. You know, in 1924, 100,000 people lived in downtown Los Angeles. And until um, just after World War II, downtown was the center of everything. It was the center of, of commerce and retail and law and the courts and just everything. And then we suburbanized out. We kind of lost our way. And uh, in the 1990s, we thought, you know what? We want to we want to get back. And so a number of us in the community that believed in downtown started working to help recruit more investment into downtown. So retailers moving here and restaurants and bars and nightclubs and office buildings and tenants. And we worked really hard. And I'm really proud to tell you that uh, it worked. When I got here in 1990, uh, Four, we had 18,000 people, David, living in downtown, down from 100,000 of people in 1924. Today, we're at 80,000 people and are on our way to 100,000 people. So maybe we'll get parity by 2024, 100,000. A few years ago, I spoke with renowned seismologist Lucy Jones, and I remember she was concerned about all these tall towers. She had told me, we met her out in Pasadena at USGS, and she said, look, if these builders, developers, real estate folks would simply invest maybe a hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand dollars more into the buildings, they would be more earthquake safe. What do you say to that? Well, you know, all I can tell you is that um, everybody is concerned about human life. A lot of times the developers of these buildings occupy the buildings. So do you think they're going to build a building that they think is going to fail around them? No. A lot of time and effort is spent with with engineering. Um, there, there are world events, world earthquakes every year that we learn from and we incorporate into our engineering. So I'm a little bit more optimistic uh, than Dr. Jones. And um, we have to remember too, in terms of business and investment, et cetera, do you think people would invest hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of dollars if they thought they were gonna build a building that was gonna fail? I don't think so. 
Good point. In closing, Hal, where does the downtown Los Angeles skyline go from here? What is the future? Is this sustainable? As I said, it's amazing what is happening in this area with the construction. Yeah, well, I certainly think it's sustainable. And we live in a region of 18 million people. Uh, and, you know, it, and there's an, an infinite demand for housing. We have a housing, uh, a housing problem. So I think it's totally sustainable. What is happening right now during COVID-19 though, is we're trying to understand, well, people learn that they can work from home. So maybe they don't need to have to come to the office every day. Well, there's a lot of moving parts. Here's the one thing I know. God stopped making land in downtown Los Angeles and the population is growing. So the demand is there. Thank you, Hal Bastian, a leader with Downtown LA Renaissance. Really appreciate the interview. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. It's always good to see you. And now from underground to underwater, the U.S. Navy routinely uses sonar in various parts of the ocean during maneuvers and exercises. But at what cost to whales and marine life can vital military training and marine mammals coexist? Steve Walsh with PBS station KPBS in San Diego has our story. The Navy destroyer USS Higgins navigates the congested waters of Southern California. During a recent training mission, they deploy a kingfisher, a type of active sonar that trails behind the ship on a long tether. They use it to hunt for mines, but the sound can seriously injure whales. As they leave San Diego Bay, below deck, the crew monitors a map on a computer screen. Lieutenant Eileen Allegra says that map tells them whether it's safe to turn on the sonar. It came up and said there's no restrictions. Um, and it tells us, you know, but if a whale comes, you know, this close to you, make sure you power down sonar by this much. The Navy created this detailed protocol over several years in response to lawsuits brought by environmental groups. Some of the Navy's most intense training happens in the waters between California and Hawaii. Carrier groups train here before deploying to the Pacific. The Marines practice amphibious landings along the California coast. But these sounds can disrupt marine life. Brett Hartle is with the Center for Biological Diversity. Many marine mammals, so beaked whales, blue whales, humpback whales, they rely on sound. We can't even hear it because they're communicating at levels we can't fathom with our ears and we can't detect it. But if they can't hear, if their hearing is, is damaged, they're basically as good as dead. It's the way they communicate. It's often the way they find food. A 2015 settlement in a federal lawsuit required the Navy to reduce the use of active sonar. Certain habitat is also off limits to the military during parts of the year, including a blue whale foraging area off the coast of San Diego. But the Navy's proposed plan loosens some of those restrictions. Alex Stone is the Navy's project manager for the new plan. Instead of in the context of litigation, we've looked at everything new using science, using what is practical for us to implement in terms of mitigation. Stone says the new plan will still take into account sensitive habitat and lays out when and where the Navy can use sonar and detonate explosives. But environmentalists say the plan erases some of the progress they fought for over the years. Brett Hartle with the Center for Biological Diversity. The Navy has made progress in the past. They have restricted some of their activities in the past. Now they're sort of backsliding a little bit. And we're concerned about that because there are reasonable ways of, of dealing with both military training and protecting marine mammals. Environmentalists want the Navy to limit explosions in sonar in more areas where they know marine mammals congregate at certain times of the year. But that would likely mean fewer exercises close to shore and the Navy resists moving exercises farther out to sea. At the end of their first day of exercises, the USS Higgins was still close enough to shore that a group of visiting midshipmen from the Naval Academy could still go back to San Diego on board small landing craft. Stone says going farther from shore isn't practical. We want to be as efficient as we can with our training and having our forces steam, you know, hundreds of miles out before they can even start training just doesn't work well. The Navy's own studies have shown the impact active sonar has on marine mammals. Even large blue whales will turn away from ships using it. Most of the time, the ships use passive sonar, essentially listening to the ocean. But active sonar is more accurate. It bounces high-intensity sound off an object. 
The Navy trains spotters to scan the horizon for marine mammals. They're supposed to shut down exercises if they see a whale breaching nearby. But Hartle says even trained spotters can't see what's under the water. Species like the endangered beak whale aren't easy to locate. I've been out on the ocean. I've done whale surveys. They're hard to find. Beak whales are only 10, 15 feet long. And in a big ocean, it's easy to miss them. In June, the California Coastal Commission unanimously rejected the Navy's plan. The two sides say they're still talking. The Navy actually doesn't need California's approval. The National Marine Fisheries Service does have to approve the plan. The current plan expires December 25th. And of course, the new plan, like the last one, could end up in court. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Thank you, Steve Walsh, with PBS station KPBS in San Diego for that report. Well, the nation's largest nuclear power plant located in western Arizona is working on a unique project to reduce the amount of wastewater used to cool the nuclear reactors. This next story is brought to you through a special collaboration with KLCS PBS and Arizona State University's Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications as we partner with and mentor students seeking to explore the environment through their reporting. Here is Madison Staten with Cronkite News. Water is critical for keeping the largest nuclear generating station in the country running. Behind me is the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station. And that's not smoke you're seeing, it's water vapor. 42,000 gallons per minute are evaporated into the atmosphere from this plant alone. That was on the day we visited, but that number can climb even higher depending on the time of year. In the winter, we can use up to 40,000 gallons per minute, and that makes up for the evaporation rate of the cooling towers at the nuclear plant. In the summer, it's more, it's up to 60,000 gallons per minute. The water is used to cool the plant. Heat is converted from nuclear reactions into electricity. The boiling water created by the steam is then cooled and condensed. Treated wastewater is used to do this. It comes mostly from the 91st Avenue Sewage Treatment Facility. But those like Sandy Barr believe using wastewater isn't enough. Utilities, you know, say, well, okay, we're using the treated wastewater, like somehow it's not a big deal that it's using so much water. But treated wastewater it can be used for all kinds of other things, uh, and including habitat restoration. So uh, it is water that is not available for other uses. The growing competition over wastewater is one reason why Palo Verde is exploring other water options. They have partnered with Sandia Labs, a national nuclear research and development laboratory in New Mexico, and have found even dirtier water to use. The other water sources that we've been looking at are poor quality groundwater sources that come from the Buckeye waterlogged area. Uh, groundwater is high in salt and high in minerals. However, we are able to use some of that water instead of effluent because of the tertiary treatment system that we have here at Palo Verde. The plant is also looking at developing more advanced cooling technology. The current target is to reduce wastewater by 20%. Right now we use about 75,000 acre feet of water every year. That equates to about 26 billion gallons of water. If we can save 20% of that, uh, that's a huge savings not only in water, but a huge savings in terms of cost. Palo Verde plans to start using this dirtier water within the year. We plan on this year being able to start pumping water. We have funding uh, and sightings for the wells. We just need approval from the, from the state and we're working with the state and the farmers in the area to work through issues and get that, get that in place. Thanks Madison Staten and the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications for that report. For more information about our program, just click on klcs.org and then click contact us to send us your questions and comments or story ideas so we can hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Sustaining Us here on KLCS PBS. I'm David Nazar.